Imagine playing a game where enemies always react the same way, no matter what you do. The behavior becomes predictable, and the replayability value immediately goes away. And for me, a good AI or NPC can be what makes a game fun. That's where finite state machines come in. FSMs allow us to create AI with diverse and dynamic behaviors, making characters react intelligently to the player's actions, whether it's a guard patrolling a fortress, a monster searching for its prey, or an NPC switching between tasks. FSMs bring AI to life, adding depth and excitement to your game. Today, we're diving into finite state machines in Unity and C Sharp, giving your AI the smarts to keep players on their toes. If you haven't checked out part one, it will be linked here and in the description. I'll give you guys a few moments to pause this video and check that out if you haven't done so yet. Okay, so state machines, or a finite state machine as it is technically called, is a structured way to design systems, being finite because you have complete control of the exact number of states it can be in at any time. Let's take an example here from a game like Dark Souls. During a boss fight, as the fight goes on and as the boss is at a lower and lower health, the attack variations can change. And this is because of a finite state machine. Let's dumb it down. If the boss's health is greater than 50%, you do a simple strike attack every 3 seconds. If the boss's health is between 20 and 50%, do a combo attack every 2 seconds. And if the boss's health is lower than 20%, run away and do more dodges. Now, this may look obvious, but this is exactly how you would handle a finite state machine. These conditions allow only one behavior variation at a time so that we have complete control of exactly how these systems should interact. But we can expand that into so much more. Now, before we jump into our Unity project, I'll briefly go over exactly what the state machine will look like that we'll be using, but this will be a basic concept that I would love for you guys to expand into so much more. As always, the timestamps for this video are as follows, so feel free to navigate as necessary. I'll also point out that all the code for this project and the project itself is available completely for free through my GitHub page, which is linked here and in the description of this video. So if you get stuck at any point, you can check that out as well. Our AI will be a super basic variation of an enemy you would see in a roguelike with three main states. Patrol will be the default state that the enemy is in when it hasn't seen the player, so the enemy will just jump from node to node and sort of cruise around. Engage will be when the player is spotted and the enemy target the player's position and move towards it. Defend will be when the player is spotted, but the enemy's health is below 20% and will instead run away from the player. As I said, this is a super basic state machine and the possibilities for what you can do is limitless. So I encourage you guys to expand on this as much as you can. Opening up our Unity project from part one, I'll catch you up on what I've done. I'm working in the universal scene, but this can work with the random walker aspect just as well. I've created some walls around the scene and added collisions to the tile map and the walls so that our character can work with gravity. I've also added a few more nodes into the scene as you can see here and added their connections as explained with the technique from part one of this video. I've created a very simple playable character controller which uses the same inputs from a regular side scroller, so running and jumping. I've also created a simple projectile which just shoots in the direction you're facing. And the AI has a simple health stat which tracks the current health and max health. And if it interacts with the projectile, we'll lose part of its health. At the moment, if we press play, this is what the scene looks like. You can see that the AI has no functionality other than just moving from node to node, and our player can just run and jump around the scene. Now that we're caught up, it's time to make our AI smart. Starting with our A star manager script, let's begin by creating two new functions. These functions were pretty slim with how they work, but it will be used to find specific nodes in the list rather than the random node that we were using before. We will call these functions find furthest node and find nearest node. Both these functions will return a node, and both will take one argument of a vector 2, which we can just call position. For now, let's have these return null. After we do that, we'll create another public function which will return an array of nodes. We can call this nodes in scene. In this function, we can just say return find objects of type node. To visualize what these methods will be doing, we'll use the nearest node as an example. We have our map layout like this, and our nodes on the map like this. Let's say we have our enemy on this node, and our player on this node. This function will be called from our enemy, and it will pass in the position of the player. We'll start by defining a minimum distance as an unnecessarily large number, and have a reference to an empty node. Then we will loop through each node in the scene. For every node, we will track the distance between that node and the player. If the distance of the node is less than the minimum distance that we defined earlier, then we know that this node is close to the player. We store that node to our empty node, and continue the loop. Once every node is checked, it will continuously update the values of what the minimum distance is and what the stored node should be. At the end of the function, we can simply return the referenced node from the start as it will have been populated with the correct value. For finding the furthest distance, it will be the same concept, but in reverse. Let's get this coded in. Starting with the find nearest node, we will define a node that we can call found node as null. We 
a set of float that we can call min distance as the float max value. Then using a for each loop, we check each node. We keep track of the current distance with a float variable called current distance that is equal to the vector two distance between the current node's transform and the position from the vector two parameter. Then we check if the current distance is less than the minimum distance. And if it is, we wanna set the minimum distance to be the current distance and update our found node to the current node that we're scanning. At the end of the function, instead of returning null, we will return the found node instead. Now with the find furthest node, we will do a similar setup. Our found node will be null, but this time our max distance can just be zero. Again, loop through using our for each, and again, keep track of the current distance with the float variable, and again, make it equal to the vector two distance between the current node's transform and the position from the vector two parameter. This time we will check if the current distance is greater than the max distance, and if it is, we want to set the max distance to be the current distance and update our found node to the current node that we're scanning. Again, at the end of the function, we will replace the null return with the found node. Back in Unity now, if you haven't yet created your NPC controller script, now will be the time to do so. I briefly went over it in the first video, but I'll go in more depth on how to set it up now. If you have created the NPC controller script from the first video and it looks like this, we're just gonna delete everything and start fresh. For our variables, we want a public reference to a node which we can call our current node, a list of nodes called our path, and a reference to our player. This will be whatever you're using as your player script. For me, I have called it player controller. And finally, a private float that we can call speed. We can set this to something like three. We'll also create a public enum called our state machine with three properties inside. These will be the names of our states, patrol, engage, and evade. If you're planning on adding more states, feel free to do so. The ordering of the names here don't matter. Below that, we'll create a reference to the state machine, which we can call our current state. That will be it for our variables, and we can move into our function setup. We'll start by including our start and update functions, and for every state you have in your state machine, you want to create a function for them like this. Patrol, engage, and evade. We can leave them empty for now. We also want to create a function called create path, which will be used for the main movement logic. In our start method, we want to set the current state to the state machine patrol. Next, moving with our update method, we will create a switch case so that the correct method is being called per frame for the correct state. For this switch, we'll pass in our current state. Then inside of this block, we can split up the different cases. If the state is patrol, then we call the patrol method. If it's engage, we call the engage. And if it's evade, then we can call the evade method. And of course, if you're including other states in your state machine, to include them here. Now, before we start filling out the different functions, we still need a way to actually change what the current state is. And to do that, still in our update method, but below the switch case, we'll create our state machine. To do that, we first check the state we're trying to change to isn't already set. If it is, then there's no need to set it again. Our main state will be patrol. So we will say, if current state is not equal to state machine patrol, current state equals patrol. It's also important to note here that this if block chain needs to use else ifs. Otherwise it's possible for it to cycle through each state infinitely and never land on the correct one. We'll say if current state is not equal to state machine engage, current state equals engage. And finally, the else if current state is not equal to evade, we'll set the current state to evade. Now, we're not done just yet. First, whenever we want to change the current state, we also want to clear the pathless immediately after it, like this. You might notice as well, what this part of the code would do at the moment is infinitely set the state between the first and second condition. And that's because within our if statements, we need to make sure that this extra condition is met. So that when the AI is finding the correct state, it knows based on the conditions where it needs to go. For example, we only want the patrol state if the player isn't within the line of sight and the current health is greater than 20% of the max health. And to figure out line of sight, we will just use a bool that gets updated when the player is nearby, which looks like this. Before our if block, we will create a bool called player scene, which will be equal to the vector two distance between the enemy and the player being less than five. Five is an arbitrary unit that I've used that you can alter to fit the context of your game. We only want the engage if the player is seen and the enemy's health is greater than 20% of its max health, which will look like this. And finally, the evade is only if the health is less than 20% of the max health. Now, I will point out here as well, state machines work in a hierarchical system. For simplicity, I have put the ordering of these statements in the order in which I made the state machine, but you can take it a step further by restructuring it for the state that should take precedence. For example, if the NPC's health is below a certain value, then you would make that the first if statement. Then inside the if block, we double check if the current state is evade. This way, it will always prioritize this statement as the correct statement and not flick between states unnecessarily. Anyway, now that we have our state machine set up, we will finally do a call to our create paths function at the very end of update to ensure it gets called every frame. Now we can finally get into the actual state functions. 
Each function will be similar in setup, but the way in which they generate a path will be slightly different. For example, the goal node for patrol will always be random, the goal node for engage will be the node nearest to the player, and the goal node for evade will be the node furthest from the player. Let's set them up now, starting with patrol. First we will check if the path count is zero. We do this check because we don't want to update the path midway through movement. Next we set the path equal to the A star managers instance generate path method. And of course this takes two parameters being the start and end node. For this we just pass the current node as our start, and for our end we can get a reference to each node using our A star instances node in scene function, and then our index will be a random node between zero and the node in scene's length. Next let's move on to our engage function. With the same setup as before, we will first check if the path count is zero. If it is, then we can again set the path equal to the A star manager instance's generate path method. We will still use our current node as our start, but for our end node we will call the A star instance's find nearest node function and pass in the player references transform. Finally, let's move on to our evade function. Again following the same setup as the previous two functions, we will check if the path count is zero, and if it is, again set our path equal to the generate path method. Again, use our current node as the start, but our end node will be the find furthest node function from the A star instance, again passing the player's reference transform as the parameter. We now have our state set up, we have switching between state set up, and we have our pathing set up. All that's left to do is actually move our object around the scene using the path list. Inside of our create paths function, we'll start by checking if the path count is greater than zero. If it is, then we can create an int variable at zero. We then want to update the transform using vector3 move towards. I use vector3 here so that I have control of the z value, but if you're using proper sprite sorting orders, then you can just use a vector2. For the parameters, we'll use current transform, the target transform, and the speed of movement. Our current transform will just be the transform position. The target, we will say new vector3, and in our x and y coordinates, it will be the path list at index x, transform position x and y respectively. For our z value, we can just say negative one. Then for the movement speed, we will just say speed multiplied by the delta time. Below that, we will have an if statement that checks if the distance between the NPC and the target node is less than or equal to 0.1. This is deliberately a small number with the idea being once it has reached the node or super close to it, we remove it from the list and update our target to the next node in our path. Then in the if block, we will update the NPC's current node value to be equal to the node that it just got to, and then remove that node from the list. And like that, we have our NPC. Let's test it out in the editor and see what it looks like. If the NPC is not yet in the scene, let's drag it in now. We place it on top of or close to a node, and whichever node it's on, we will drag that into the NPC's current node reference. We also want to make sure that the player reference has been filled out as well. We can leave the path empty, and we can get ready to press play. The first thing that we're going to be looking at here is the current state enum. As you can see, by default, it's set to patrol. Now, if we move our player close to it, we can see that it changes to engage, where it chases the player down and moves towards the node closest to it. Now let's knock its health down, and you can immediately see it start to run away. Now this is an extremely basic example of a finite state machine, but I hope that is enough to get you guys going on your journey. If you're having trouble setting it up, or want to leave a suggestion for a future tutorial, leave a comment down below. If you haven't as well, be sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with all my videos. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll catch you all soon.